other than our own Reverend Dr. Bernard E. Hinton, as he brings forth the word of God, and as, as he teaches us based on this wonderful book entitled The 40 Day Word Fast. Amen. 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 I, Amen. Pray that, um, I pray that you have acquired this book. It's an awesome text. So uh, if you haven't retreat gotten it yet, please do so. It is powerful. Amen. All right, Pastor. God bless you. Amen. Good evening to everybody. I hope everybody's doing great on this evening. Good to see everybody in the land of living. Amen. Thank you so much for your prayers and your concern. I feel a hundred times better. Amen. And so we are indeed grateful to God. Uh, the goal was to start um, our our forty day fast, word fast, which we I'll close out with that before we uh, end on tonight. If you haven't gotten the book already, please go ahead and do so. I'll actually start Bible study on next week pertaining to the power of our words. Um, but I I wanted to focus in and just close out uh, uh, on from where we were on last week uh, because I had a little bit more information I wanted to give as it pertained to vision. Uh, but also as it pertains to us just being able to move forward. And I believe we are right in line. So thank you so much to Dr. Obi uh, in my absence and to each and every one of you. So let's jump right in on tonight. Some of it will be reviewed. So I'm gonna move very quickly uh, so that we can get to the portion at the end, which is our 40 day word fast. Now, one of the things I know that everybody may not get the book. Uh, and so what I am looking to do, I will get with uh, Sister Paul and perhaps maybe uh, do a daily synopsis so that th that information can be emailed to everybody daily uh, so that we can all be on the same page. So I'll get with um, uh, I'll get with uh, Sister Paul in relationship to that. All right. Let's jump right in. Let me share my screen and we will be able uh, if you will, Reverend Pennis, if you will give me the uh, capabilities to share my screen. Uh, while she's doing that, I got to say this huge, huge shout out uh, to uh, to our mass choir for the entire Black History program. It was absolutely phenomenal. Amen. Amen. Yeah, you can Amen. put your hands together for that. It was phenomenal. It was Amen. informative. It was a spirit of excellence. I was blessed. And I'm sure if it was that good at the house, it had to be even better in-house. So <laughs> I'm grateful to God uh, for Sister Erica and her entire team. Uh, and it was just absolutely amazing. I was so proud. You should have seen me. I was high five in the air. So <laughs> nevertheless, God is good. All right. So let's jump right in on tonight. Thank you so much, Reverend Penix, for allowing me to be able to share. Uh, remember, some of this may be um, uh, review, so I will try to move as expeditiously as possible. All right. So let me uh, do our slideshow. Uh, some of this may be a little different from last week because I want to try to capture uh, where we are as we move forward. Uh, of course, we will begin preaching <clears throat> on uh, this week on the actual uh, power of our words uh, so that we can move forward. I've tried to be methodical in moving us from, uh, from stretching as it relates to our giving, stretching as it relates to our vision, and now as we move forward, understanding vision and get into a little bit of culture tonight, but then also uh, push forward with understanding the power that our words play as it relates to the vision and as it relates to us stretching uh, through our giving. So let's jump right in. A um, couple of guiding questions I wanted to have for tonight. Do you see yourself making a difference for the kingdom of God? Uh, and that question is going to be couched in us uh, going through our vision as a church. I've tried to walk us through uh, the vision, individual vision that we have, but also Corporately, what does it mean for us to have vision as a church and, and our vision that we say each and every Sunday, hopefully we're beginning to internalize it so that it can become a part of who we are and we can begin to do uh, exactly what is what is calling for us to do. Uh, but, but, but the question I want to pose tonight is, do you see yourself as a difference maker? I believe that every believer should be someone who seeks to make an indelible mark in, the, in all of eternity. And what I mean by that is that you should seek to put forth such an impact and an effort. Remember, I gave you some areas that we are uh, that we are stretching in, right? Our investment, right? Our impact, okay? And so we know um, th those are just two of the areas, but, but tonight, especially making a difference. I believe that believers ought to make a difference. We are called to make a difference in the world. That the Bible says we are in the world, but not of the world. And we're gonna look at some scripture on that on tonight. Do you really believe that God can and will use you to impact the world? I believe, uh, I believe wholeheartedly within myself that God 
is going to use me in such a way that you never know who you'll reach, who you'll touch, who you'll bless that will be able to benefit the entire world uh, from your touch. And so I'm always, I'm always um, um, cautious in understanding, uh, hey, my baby with Sister Stephanie, hey, baby. <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, I just saw, uh, but I'm always cautious to make sure that we have a great impact, hey, that we have a great impact in everything that we do, all right? Uh, so that, that people's lives can be transformed. Are you producing fruit where God has placed you? I believe this wholeheartedly. There is such thing as a set place. I believe that when we are in the place where God wants us to be and we're doing what God wants us to do, then God is able to get the glory, but the kingdom is able to be advanced. Somebody ought to put that in. When we are in the set place where we're supposed to be, we're not trying to be somewhere else, but we are where we believe God has called for us to be and we're doing what God has called for us to do, I believe then that God is able to get the glory and the kingdom is advanced. I'm gonna say it one more time because that's a mouthful. When we are in our set place, our ordained place, where we believe that God has called us to be, therefore we're able to do what God has called us to do, where he's called us to be. And when we do what God has called us to do, where, he called, where he's called us to be, then we are able to bring his name glory, but we are also able to advance the kingdom of God. All right. Uh, hopefully y'all got that because nobody put it in the chat. Y'all y'all still with me? All right. There we go. There we go. Thank you, Sister Stephanie. When we are in our set place, we're able to do what God calls us to do. And we're able to make sure that, that we're not trying to be somewhere else, but we are exercising the gifts that God has for us right where he's placed us. All right. <clears throat> So our vision statement, and, and this is a quick review, our vision statement, as we know then, is that snapshot, if you will, of where we believe that God is taking us. Now, we know that for some of this, this is a review, so I want to make sure that that, that is clear, uh, but it's where we're called to go. We talked about how vision is the big picture, is that mental picture of where we believe the conviction that God would have for us to go. Uh, simply put, vision is that description of what we see in the future. Now, one of the things that we talked about uh, over the last several weeks is that part of having vision is understanding that it is not becoming satisfied with the status quo. Somebody put that in. Part of having vision is not becoming satisfied with the status quo. That means there is a, here's a good word for you. There is a holy irritation. I just made that up. But there is a holy irritation that you ought to have never to be satisfied where you are but to always seek to strive to higher heights and deeper depths. Now, this is not saying that we ought not ever become content. I understand contentment in God in all things. However, we ought to have a holy irritation that pushes us, that pricks us, that nudges us beyond where we are right now and pushes us into a future that we believe that God would have for us to walk into. All right. And so as a church, then this is our vision statement. I want to spend some time and break it down. I know Dr. Obi did a phenomenal job breaking it down on last week. I just want to kind of touch up. I added a few things because I thought it was important because if we say this each and every week, I want us to get a picture of what that looks like. All right. Because this statement is pregnant. This statement is loaded. All right. I won't have time to get into the, I mean, to mission on tonight, but I will try to unpack this as best I can with moving through the different clauses. All right. So Springfield's vision is to lead people to become devoted disciples, discover their purpose and make a difference for the kingdom. If you have not committed that to memory, I pray that you will internalize it and commit it to memory, all right? It is to lead people to become devoted disciples, discover their purpose, and make a difference for the kingdom. Here's the breakdown. One, to lead people to become devoted disciples. Now, that's a whole lot in itself, is it not? Because one, what does it mean to lead people? What does it mean to lead people to become disciples? What does it mean to lead people to become devoted disciples? You see where that's going? So now we got to lead people, okay? And the only way you lead people is that somebody got to follow, okay? So lead people to become devoted disciples. Second piece is to lead people to discover their purpose. So after we lead people and they become dis devoted disciples or learners, then that enables them to discover their purpose. Because if you're not willing to learn from God, how do you how do how are you able to discern what God's purpose for you to do? Does that make sense? If you if you and I if we're not willing to be eternal learners, somebody put that in. We ought to be eternal learners. That means we always seek to learn. We never feel like we have arrived. We are devoted disciples, always learning, so that we're able to grow in the grace of God daily. If you're still alive, you ought to be growing. 
Somebody put that in. If you have breath in your body, you ought to be growing, okay? So it is to lead people to become devoted disciples and to lead them to discover their purpose. And what's the third piece? We lead people that once they become devoted disciples and they discover their purpose, we believe that sweet spot, if you will, is where God is able to help or use them to make a difference or impact for the kingdom of God. All right, let's break it down. And I'm moving quickly because I know some of this is a review. Hopefully it's, all of it is a review from Dr. Obi. So to lead people to become devoted disciples, I got to say this, understanding that word disciple simply means learner, a follower. Jesus had what? 12 disciples. Now we call them 12 disciples, but that's, that's really the way of saying 12 men who learn with him. We know that they become what? Apostles, right? Okay. Now I would ask y'all a trick question. I would ask y'all, was every one of the disciples an apostle, but I ain't gonna go there. I ain't gonna mess with y'all on tonight. I, I'm just getting back, so I won't mess with y'all on tonight. Uh, but that's just a little trivia for you. Was every one of the disciples, did every one of the disciples become an apostle? Because remember, what were the qualifications for a becoming an apostle? One, you had to be with Jesus the whole time. Two, you had to be a witness to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we know that, watch this, one of them did not make it, <laughs> Judas. So Judas is the only disciple that did not become an apostle. That's another story for another time. Just figured I'd give you a little Bible trivia. So that we know then that when, when they move from being just mere disciples, if you will, to apostles, then that took on another whole, whole life. But we are called as believers to be learners, to be disciples. Now, what does that mean? That means then we must, we must seek to follow and trust in the Lord in such a way where we follow his word, and examples. Somebody put in, put that in, both words and examples. Now that is critical. It's one thing to do what Jesus says. It's another thing to do what he does. Got it? So what do you mean by that? We can say, oh, uh, uh, love the Lord your God with all our heart. And, you know, then we can talk about loving our neighbor. So it's one thing to do what he says. It's another thing to follow that example. So we can say Jesus said that, but the example of that is when he was willing to go to a cross and die for the very ones who was who crucified him. Okay, so 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 we understand then uh, the power of this. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Consequently, then being a disciple is about being in relationship with Jesus Christ. It is seeking to be like Him, and when we seek to be like Jesus, we learn from Him. Now, here is the key: if you're going to be devoted a devoted disciple, then you got to be close to the Lord. Okay, and we have to have something in place that I'm going to talk about in just a minute, where we help people grow closer to the Lord. Here, 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 is, here is a way to understand how I think about ministry. For me, I, I, used, to be, uh, uh, I used to be the minister of discipleship at a church that had about, about 12,000 people, right? And my job was to help people take a step in their spiritual growth. So, so when you hear me say things like, for example, when I do an invitation, you'll hear me say the, the, the language of spiritual decision, right? And, and, I, and understand what I'm saying. I'm saying, I want to give you the opportunity to make a spiritual decision. That decision may be for you to give your life. That decision may be for you to rededicate your life. That decision may be for you to become a member of the church, right? But that is making a spiritual decision to grow, all right? When you hear me talk about giving, even our 90-day time challenge, that is a spiritual decision because it is you and I taking a step, a tangible step in growing in our spiritual discipleship. So when we begin to understand that, then later on, we'll see that we must have apparatuses in place to help grow us as believers. This is making sense on tonight. So you can kind of begin to see some of the things that, that, that we will be shaping over the next six months to a year so that we can begin to have things in place that we're not just having wishful thinking when we have our vision or when we would say our vision, but we have put the mechanisms in place to begin to produce that which we're seeking to produce, all right? Because faith without works is dead. There we go, all right? So, 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 so being a disciple means that we learn from him, we stay close to him. Look at Luke 640. It says, the student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Now we know that yes, we have the ability to train other believers, but we have the privilege and the blessed assurance of the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher, who is our tutor, who is our guide. And so we'll see that part of becoming a devoted disciple is not only being in a relationship with Jesus Christ, but also having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. 
All right. Now that's another whole class, another whole session. Maybe, maybe I'll do some teaching uh, this year on stretching uh, our control to relinquish it, to give to the Holy Spirit, because that's another whole topic uh, for another time. Okay. All right. Let, let's keep going. So, uh, I, 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 all right. So, if, okay. All right. Somebody needs to mute themselves, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So, being a devoted disciple, then it means, of course, we talked about this worship, servant, and witness. And when we understand those three areas, we know a disciple is a worshiper. That's the first thing. Um, we know that the hour is coming with a true worshiper must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay, so so a disciple is a worshiper. I'm moving quickly because this should be a review. They worship personally, so that means as a disciple, your first your first your first line, if you will, of worship is is personal worship. Okay, that means before you ever show up at 508 P Street or before you ever show up uh, uh, to, to 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 Ferries Road, right? That means you should have already begun your worship. If you got to wait to Sunday to worship, then, then you're missing six days of worship. Every day your feet hit the ground, you ought to thank the Lord. You ought to worship the Lord. You ain't got to sing to be able to sing a little song, right? Right. You, it, your, your, your shower should be a sanctuary of worship. <laughs> Everybody sounds good in the shower, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you should behave. Yeah, I preach my best sermons in the shower. I ain't gonna lie to you. Some of the ones you'll never hear. The best one. Every towel in my shower is saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. <laughs> yes, they are. Yes, they are. Okay. Uh, so worship is personal. But then there ought to be moments where you not only worship personally, but you worship with family. It, it, it may be it may be the time of year where you Thanksgiving, where y'all break sing a song together. You know, a lot of families like to get together and sing a song. You know, they have Brother Bass break out in song, and everybody just join around. Y'all know how we do it, right? Have a have a, have a family reunion and, and Papa starts singing. Maybe the last time I don't know. Well, it may be the last time we ever sing together. You know, that, that's the type of stuff where you begin to worship together as a family. But not only do you worship personally, you worship as a family, but you also worship as a church congregation. That is what we call the coming together, if you will, both in person and online, where we worship with our local congregation. That's where the Bible says, forsake not yourself, the assembling of the saints. That means there is benefit when we worship together, okay? When we come to worship together with one another, there are benefits to it. Because why? We get to look at others. We get to see how God is moving in their lives. And, and we have learned, especially over the last several weeks, we've experienced the power of the Holy Spirit being released in our services. And I believe that God is going to continue to do that because I believe wholeheartedly that part of the reason why God is releasing his spirit in the, in the congregational services is because people are allowing the spirit to be released in their personal worship and in their family worships. Okay. All right. And of course, worship in the world. That means when we don't just worship within a building, but we go even beyond that. Uh, into the uttermost parts of the world, and we're willing to take our worship with us. So we worship personally. I hit on that uh, again. I'm moving quickly now because I don't want to. I don't want to be redundant. Uh, we worship the Lord with our family. That means read scripture together, pray together, uh, listen to God-centered music. Uh, uh, worship the Lord with your church congregation. I've already talked about that, and of course, worship the Lord in the world. Now, now let, let's 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 break down our vision, if you will. So if we're gonna have devoted disciples, these are just four basic areas that we need to have to, to, to be able to develop disciples, if you will. One is accountability. One of the things that Jesus was, 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 was key on for three and a half years was that he had uh, men around him that were able to be held accountable, all right? Now, that, that, is, that is something we don't always like to talk about in church, but think about how you grew. Y'all wanna know how, you wanna know how you grew in church? You grew because you had somebody that, that, that held you accountable. Now, if we can be honest, some of the people, some of our heroes and sheroes in the faith who may be going on to glory, guess what? They held you accountable. That Sunday school teacher who, you know, it, it's funny. Do y'all remember when I first came and, 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 and I asked stories about, you know, people that, that were influential? There were names that kept coming up, Deacon Kelsey and, 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 and names like that that just kept coming up over and over and over again. And watch this, they're going on to glory, but their mark has been left in the earth. Here you are still kicking, still going on, right? 
uh, right? Deacon Anderson. And you, you just heard these great testimonies of those who had gone on before. It, it was that, 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 that great cloud of witnesses, if you will, people who held you accountable, folk who would call you if you missed service, ask you, where were you, <laughs> right? Right. You couldn't duck them. You could, you, you know, they see you at church and say, baby, I noticed today something went right with you. I felt it in my spirit. What's going on? Talk to me. That's accountability. All right. And so we know that's part of being a disciple. Now, we, that's one part. So it is having the ability to be accountable. And you'll see that we're going to put some things in place to help us grow people from accountability standpoint, because accountability is not always, uh, how can I say, it? it's not about being nosy. It's about holding and, and being there for somebody else. Having a prayer partner is accountability, right? The, the, the world has figured it out. So the world has what they call accountability groups, right? If you, there is a group for anything you want to do. You want to lose weight, there's an accountability group online for that. If you want to uh, have a, a vision board party, there's an accountability group on board. There are different groups to, to be able to bring accountability because what happens when we have accountability? Your results are maximized, right? When I say accountability, I like to call them revelation role models. Somebody put that in. Revelation role models. Revelation role models are people that God allows you to see who are further down the road than you are. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's that's good there. Right, look, y'all got to hear me. A revelation role model is when God allows you to see somebody who is further down the road than you are, and they can give you some wisdom to help you where you are now to get beyond where you are now. Okay. And, and, and I wish I had time, I would have gone through different examples from, uh, from, from Paul uh, to Timothy, right? You'll see that there were different types of accountability they had, right? Mentorship. And we'll see that that's, that's key, um, excuse me, not only for, for now, but even for in the future with our young people. So accountability is one thing. One of the things you're going to hear me talk about is developing groups, Right, where, where as God continues to grow us from a virtual reality and an in person reality, then we got to keep people connected. We got to make sure that we have people on the same page. So, we're going to have accountability groups where that would be small group setting where people can stay connected with one another and be held accountable to pray for one another, to encourage one another. Right, whether you are in the DMV or Florida or Texas or North Carolina, South Carolina, wherever you are, we want you to be able to have some accountability. Right. Well, here's the second part, and this is so crucial. This probably this is probably the most comprehensive part of, 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 of developing disciples, and that is developing a discipleship plan. Now, this is something that will require a lot of time, energy, and effort. Why is that? Because this is the plan that we will put in place that says if you go through these steps, you will grow. Right. And and watch this, because part of it is every disciple is called to make disciples. So if you're bringing in the Great Commission, bringing in people, then there ought to be a plan in place to help grow people. You ought not say, just get in where you fit in. No, let's, 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 let's help grow these people. Let's help them discover their spiritual gifts. Let's help them discover that God has a purpose for their lives. Let's help them discover that, that the moment they come to Christ, everything that they used to do doesn't stop immediately. Help them understand what it means to grow. And we do that by putting some type of discipleship plan. Another word, I'll give you another word for discipleship. You hear some people talk about assimilation, all right? Uh, another word for discipleship is, uh, is the assimilation plan. And so assimilation plan, it can be as detailed from the first visit that somebody makes until the moment they become a, 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 a member. And from that moment, you know, you just be able to kind of map out a roadmap. Here's why. People are more likely to go down the road if they know what's down the road, <laughs> okay? If you just say, hey, just start reading your Bible and you don't have classes in place to help them grow, right? New, survey of the New Testament, survey of the Old Testament, class on the Holy Spirit, a class on how to study the Bible, a class on prayer. You see where I'm going with this? So you put mechanisms in place as a part of your discipleship program to help people grow in their journey, all right? And that is what is especially necessary for, for this generation. Here is why. This generation that the church is called to reach now is the most unchurched generation in the life of the church. Do y'all understand that? I, when I'm preaching now, I can't say y'all know the story of David and Goliath because not everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. Not everybody had the same drug problem, which, you know, drug to Sunday school, drug to church. Not everybody had that same problem that we had, right? You went to everything. 
We had Twilight Sunday School, right? And so not everybody had that issue now. Not everybody had, had those issues that we had where you missed Sunday, Sunday football because you were at, in church, right? Then you were in the basement eating in between. It, you didn't have all that. So it, that's what we had. So now we have to grow people from where they are to where we know that God wants them to be. So it is one, accountability. It is two, a, disciple, a comprehensive discipleship plan. But it's three, helping people to tap into the grace of God. Now, why is that so critical? That is critical because oftentimes when it comes to growing in God, people see it as a huge task, right? It is so easy to look at somebody else and compare yourself. Somebody put this in. Comparison is the thief of joy. Somebody put that in. Put that in the chat for me. Comparison is the thief of joy. Whenever you and I start comparing ourselves to somebody else, you, you can rest assured that it's going to take your joy. Well, I wish I knew scripture the way they know it. They don't know scripture the way you think they do. They just know the certain ones that make you think they know a whole lot, right? Oh, I wish I could pray the way they do. Listen, it, there is no set way to pray, right? You learn the components of prayer, and then you develop your own prayer life, okay? So we got to tap help people to tap into that grace of God um, component. And then the last piece is a conviction for growth. People have to believe and know that they're going to grow. One of the things I make sure, it is my assignment, it is my goal to make sure that if you come to Springfield, listen to it, we're going to grow. Now, if you, now, it's up to you to choose to eat. Now, my mama would say it like this, you're going to sit here till you eat. So if you, you can sit here all night if you want to, but you will eat them peas, right? You ain't getting up on the table to eat them peas. So, 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 so it is my goal to make sure that every chance I get, there is something nutritious that's on the plate to eat. Now, 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 it is not my goal to give you cotton candy and popcorn every time I see you. That is not the goal. The goal is to make sure you have some stuff that you don't like sometimes. I know you don't like okra. I know you don't like Brussels sprouts. I know you don't like it. So I, I get it, but you're going to have to eat your spinach at some point, Popeye. You're going to have to make sure that it's in your system so that you can grow and know that you can grow. Okay? All right. Is this making sense tonight? All right. <clears throat> so, excuse me. So then when we, as we further break it down, being a disciple is the servant. Now, we know then that servanthood is, is, is after we are able to look at the life of Jesus and see that, that Jesus was a servant, where he was able to do things out of a spirit of love. He says, look, I wash your feet. Make sure you wash one another's feet. Now, don't get scared. I'm not saying we're doing a foot washing ceremony, but if we did, I'm sure y'all would be able to participate because some of y'all like, I ain't washing nobody's feet. I get it. I get it. I get it. Um, uh, foot washing ceremonies are very big in what we call primitive Baptist churches. Uh, they, they, they do foot washing ceremonies all the time, right? And so, but, but what, it, what it does is speaks to a level of humility so that we're able to know that whatever God calls us to do, none of us are above it, all right? So Galatians 6 and 10 says, therefore, we have opportunity to let us do good to all people, especially those who belong uh, to the household of faith, and that's those who are believers. And of course, a disciple is called to be a witness. So did y'all see that? A worshiper? Did y'all catch it? A worshiper, a servant, and also a witness. As a witness then, the witness ties into the Great Commission. Go ye therefore into all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20 says, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So a witness means that we speak and tell others about what we have personally experienced about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So, so, so I have, I have a simple thing. Uh, call people, reach people. <laughs> call people, reach people. Saved people, save people. So, so save people, save people, call people, reach, call people, reach people, right? Change people, change people. However you, any word you want to throw in there that speaks to it, those who are in the light, go get those out the darkness. However you want to put it, as a witness, that's what we're called to do, all right? We're on a mission for God, and, and we're not going to let anything turn us back. So that's the first part. We are called to do what? To develop disciples. Second piece, to lead them to discover their purpose. Now, what does that look like? The Bible says in Ephesians 2 and 10, we are his handiwork created to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance. We were created for purpose on purpose. That purpose is, is where we find our gifts, our skills, our talents, our abilities, 
our spiritual gifts, where we understand that God created and gave us grace gifts to pursue and to, and, and to fulfill a purpose that he put in us before we were ever born, okay? All right, so we, we have uniquely been gifted differently to be able to fulfill the overall arching plan that God has for us to do, especially as the church. Now, we talked about the, the spiritual gift. The moment we are, 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 are reborn, if you will, everyone receives a spiritual gift. Your spiritual gift may not be my spiritual gift, but we all receive spiritual gifts and God distributes them based on his own wisdom and graciousness, all right? There's a, there's a Greek word for spiritual gift. One word is charis, C-H-A-R-I-S, I believe it is. Uh, but it talks about how gifts are given at the volition of God, all right? We don't get to determine our own gifts, okay? Now, let, let, me, let me say this. Uh, singing is a talent, not a gift, not a spiritual gift, all right? People are talented singers, but it's not a spiritual gift. And we'll do a whole class on that later on. Of course, we know spiritual gifts are meant to help build up the church, draws us closer together. The Bible says we are one body with many members. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, but I do want to read a couple of them. It says, uh, Romans 12, 4, and 8, 4 through 8 says, for just as we are one body with many members, these members don't all have the same function. We Listen, unity is not uniformity. Somebody put that in. Unity is not uniformity. Oftentimes we come to church and most people are driven away from church because we want everybody to look the same, act the same, dress the same, talk the same. And that is not godly, okay? Folk are supposed to be different from you. The Bible says we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, right? Kill your people. So, so we are all made in imago day of God. We're all made in this image, but the same way we all have different fingerprints, we all are different in God. So we don't have the same gifts, but we, we don't have the same function, but we, we are able to know that we are one body because we all belong to each other. Look at verse six, and I highlighted it in, in, in turquoise. It says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So all of us have, it's grace, it's a grace gift, all right? So I won't go into to that anymore. So that is, that is the second part then. I, I'm trying to move fast so we can get into some of the other stuff I want to deal with tonight to lead people to discover their purpose, but thirdly, to lead them to make a difference in the kingdom. What does that look like to make a difference? Here is what make, making a difference look like. It means that you were designed to make a difference with your life that will last for eternity. I, you remember a couple of Bible studies back, I asked the question, if, if we closed our doors today, would anybody miss us? Remember I asked that question, if Springfield closed his doors, would anybody miss us? Would, would our impact be felt, okay? Not, not just in the, in, in the DMV, but beyond, okay? So making a difference for the kingdom then, it, it, is, it is about helping people to remain connected to the heart of God because you can't make a difference for God if you don't know what God wants you to do. <laughs> Makes sense? So you gotta be connected to the pulse of God, to the heart of God, so that his eternal values it is in us and he's able to use us for the purpose of changing the world, okay? Now, here, here is the key with making a difference. And this is, this is what I found. And I hope you find this too. If you're gonna make a difference, what, the first thing you gotta realize is that the power that God places in us to make a difference is not our own power, it's his power. It is not our own power, it is his power. So it is the power that God gives us to be able to do that. Now, look at Matthew chapter five, verse 13. This is, this is what making a difference is like. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? If you are no longer good for anything but be, to be thrown out and trampled under the foot, foot, you are the light of the world. A town on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. The same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. So we are called to be both salt and light. Maybe I'll preach one day, turn on the light and pass the salt. Maybe I'll do that one day because we are, we are called to influence. We are called to go into dark places and shine a light. Darkness is the absence of light. When you show up, darkness has to dissipate. When you show up, flavor is now infected into the, the, the atmosphere that, that you're in, okay? That means we have, a, we are difference makers, okay? 
we are world changers, if you will. Uh, I, I won't go through this because uh, for the sake of time, but this is the parable of the servant that goes away and, 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 and with well, a master who goes away and he leaves different, uh, different money bags of gold to his servants. And each one had a different amount. And part of me putting this in, because I wanted us all to understand, is that we may not all receive from the Lord the same things. We might even receive the same talent, same gift, same ability. But use what you've been given to the glory of God. Don't walk around saying, well, I sure wish I could sing like Brother Bass, or I sure wish I could sing like Deacon Fields, or I, no, be who God has called you to be. Do what God has called you to do so that when he comes back, right, or when we are called home, he, we can say, you know what? We have been faithful over what was entrusted to us. All right, let's keep rolling. Uh, so so, so here, here's three things real quick to break down our vision even further. One, recognize that what God has given us, uh, giving you exactly is what you can handle for the place that God has put you in. Remember I talked about that? I already dealt with that. Use what God has given you to the best of your ability. Now, we are to grow. I believe this wholeheartedly. I, I, well, part, part of this is, is John Maxwell's fault where he says talent is not enough, right? Uh, oftentimes, people get lazy when they're gifted. All right, I want y'all to hear me. Oftentimes, gift can lead to laziness and people use their gift as a crutch. Why, why is that, Pastor? Well, People don't develop in their giftedness. As a result, come on, y'all, y'all, yeah. You, you ever heard some? Uh, no, I don't want to say. I'm about to say something. I, I won't go there. Um, <laughs> uh, have you? <laughs> I, oh, I can't even think of a good illustration now. Because what I want to say, okay, let, let me. Have you ever heard somebody preach that ha they have great oratorical skills, but yet they la lack the substance to go along with their oratorical skills? Well, part of that is development, okay? There, there is no easy way to it, right? When you see a, a lesson or a sermon, there, there is no shortcut. You got to put the time in to, in order to get the revelation and the clarity. Now, I could get up and, and try to, you know, I've never been blessed with, with a great tune or a great hoop or I can't, I can't, I can't, ooh, yeah, I can't do all that and, 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 and throw the church into a frenzy. So for me, I've always had to rely on sermon development. I've always tried to make sure that I made the simplistic plane or the obvious that's in the text where somebody says, you know what, I've read this for years and I never saw that. That that That's my lane, all right? All right, so, so it's use what you've been given to the best of your ability for his glory, which means you constantly sharpen the tools that God has given you. Is this making sense tonight? All right. You want to constantly sharpen those tools. So so do not compare what God has given you with what he's given somebody else. And I've already talked about that. Uh, this, this is with Nehemiah and the vision. And for the sake of time, I won't deal with this because I trust that Dr. Obi got a chance to deal with that, with being gripped by the vision and how Nehemiah, Nehemiah is a bad boy. Nehemiah went to the king, got permission to fix the wall and got the king to pay for it. Boy, that's a bad boy. You know you're bad when you can get somebody... <laughs> To, to pay for pay for your vision, he went, got the king to release him to pursue the vision, and then to, to give him the the, the 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 provision to go along with it. Because the the wall was in ruins in Jerusalem; it had, it had been in ruins for decades. All right. Now, why was that so critical? Well, you got to remember in fifth in fifth century BC, having walled or fortified cities were key to keep your people in and to keep the enemy out. All right, go back to the Old Testament. Remember that they marched around the walls of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Remember that, right? They, they marched and it was a fortified city. It was purpose to keep them out and keep others in, okay? And so we understand then that even, even, even burden, the burden for Nehemiah was provided with the vision and the passion that was necessary for it to be achieved. And we talked about how, how you got to pray for the vision and also plan for the vision. I know Dr. Obi did a good job with those two. Because if you just if you just have a vision and you never pray for it, see you. Why do you pray for a vision? Well, you every day I'm praying for the vision of Springfield. Why am I doing that? Because I want God to know that I need some super in my natural. <laughs> God, God, this thing. Look, I, I ain't that good of a preacher. I ain't that good of a teacher. I don't know that much, but I need some help. I need you to supernaturally touch some folks. I need you to do some things that I can't do. 
That's why you pray for the vision, okay? And then when you come out of prayer, now God, give me a plan for this vision, all right? Okay. So he, he prayed for the opportunity for the vision as we, as we looked at. When Nehemiah heard about the condition of Jerusalem, he made sure he not only saw the need in his mind, felt the pain in his heart, but he was driven to pay, pray, okay? And, and prayer is a crucial development uh, to, to vision development. It, when, when we pray, it, help, it helps us from missing out on what God is saying. Sometimes that which we need is just a prayer away. Somebody ought to put that in. Sometimes what you need is a prayer away, right? Because prayer is a, is a dialogue, not a monologue. It's not just us taking our wishes, wants, concerns to God. It is about us listening to God and hearing what God says. It is prayer that keeps our eyes open and our hearts expectant, okay? See, prayer, prayer, prayer will allow for you to see stuff you ain't seen before. It, it, it'll open your eyes to opportunity. It, it'll let you see divine inter, intervention. It'll help you see things that you missed when, without praying, okay? All right, so, so, so Nehemiah prayed that God would give him success in cash, and he prayed for favor uh, with King Anaxerxes. Uh, that, that he would have interest and support the vision. Remember I said that the king Anaxerxes was willing to not only give him the, the, the desire of his heart, but also to help pray it, pray for it. I mean, help give toward it. So the king became sympathetic to Israel's plight. Now that's major because, because the king, the king's heart was not inclined toward Israel. So that means when we have a vision there may be people who oppose the vision, but God is able to turn their hearts. Okay? All right. Nehemiah planned for the vision. That's the last piece. He spent time with a planning strategy so that everything would work out perfectly. Now, we know that when we plan, that don't mean everything going to go according to plan, but it do mean, God, I've taken time with your spirit to put forth what we are trying to do. That's all I, I've been doing for this year. We try to put together a plan. Things don't always go as planned. Look at last week. Didn't go as planned. So here I am this week having to teach what I was going to teach last week, but yet still trying to catch up and make sure that we're in place. But I believe that it is God's desire that we at least have a plan. And so I could tell you what we're going to preach and teach on all the way for the rest of the year. Now, does that mean that the spirit can't change? Absolutely, the spirit can change. But we want to make sure we have a plan. All right? All right. So this is the plan. These are the steps. I won't go through that. Uh, because hopefully you went through that on last week. Thumbs up, you went through it on last week. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. So now I want to I want to spend, give me five minutes on this, and then I'm gonna get to the book tonight for our word fast, and then and then we're in this part of our lesson. So so I I have to do this because there's a book. Uh here we go with these books, right? There's a book called Cracking Your Church's Culture Code. Cracking, I believe that's the title. Cracking Your Church's Culture Code by Dr. Sam Chan, C-H-A-N-D. Cracking Your Church's Culture Code by Dr. Sam Chan. It's a blue book with like uh, some letters on the front being turned like it's a lock or something. Uh, but this book talks about the importance of not only vision, but culture. And, and, I, and I, could, I would be remiss if I spent the last month talking about culture I mean, talking about vision and not hit upon culture. Now, I could do a whole study on culture uh, because culture is the thing, uh, as, as he says here, that culture gets you to your destination, uh, but vision determines your destination. So, so I want you to think about it like this. Remember, we, we talked about how vision is, that, is, is the destination that we're going to, right? Uh, um, uh, we talked about how, how mission is that vehicle that we use to get to our destination. But culture is how things are inside that vehicle. Because watch this, you can be going in the right direction, but if you got a bad culture, then that culture is going to eat, as Peter Drucker says, culture eats vision for lunch. Okay? Peter Drucker, Peter Drucker D-R-U-C-K-E-Y, E-R, excuse me, I think in the book, The Fifth Discipline, if I'm not mistaken, he says that, 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 that culture eats vision for lunch, which means um, that a great culture starts with a great vision. If you don't have a great vision, you never have great culture. And culture is powerful because it best works in relationship or in tandem with vision. They need each other, all right? Both vision and culture requires attention. However, 
a great vision can never out achieve bad culture. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like, uh, as one of my boys told me, he said, man, you can never out train a bad diet. He's like, I don't care how, you, how much you work out, you can't out train a bad diet, right? Same thing with it. A vision cannot outwork bad culture, all right? So <laughs> what is culture? Here it is right there. I said Peter Drucker, yeah, but there it is. Culture eats strategy for lunch. Oh, eats, eats culture, eats vision for lunch, rather. Every church has its own culture. What is culture? Culture is that invisible thing that the church does without thinking. For example, uh, the, the first 30, 60, 90 days I came in, I was trying to learn the culture of Springfield. Because believe it or not, Springfield lights have their own culture. <laughs> we, culture is how you do things without thinking, right? It, is, it may be invisible, but it's existent, okay? All right. It is how things get done from the top to the bottom and at all levels in the church. It is that, as Dr. Chan puts, it is the atmosphere that is spoken, that, that, is, that, is, that, that, that is in which the church functions. It is a pre prevalent attitude. It is a collage of both spoken and unspoken. For example, you know, it, it, is, it is culture that says, we don't do that around here. <laughs> Come on, y'all don't want to talk to me now. It is culture that says, uh, we ain't never done that before. It is culture that says, I don't know about that. I, 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 can I go further? Culture says, I know, I know, I know some of y'all may not be used to, to, to me. Well, you're probably used to me by now. You know, I can teach for days. And so I, sometimes I got to reel myself in. And so the culture of Springfield may not have been teaching for an hour and a half. <laughs> right? It may have been an hour. I don't know. But, 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 but all those are cultural things. It may be preaching. Now, I'm going to give you a good 45 minutes for preaching. My wife told me I'm long-winded. I, I, I'm long-winded. I'm not boring, but I am long-winded, right? So I, I understand that, all right? So, but, that's the, but if the culture is used to 20 minutes and I'm giving 45, that means they didn't miss half the sermon, right? So, so, so it's a cultural thing. So understanding then how culture works. Culture is understood. It goes together. And, and vision and culture are not interdependent, but independent, but rather interdependent. And here, here's the difference in vision and culture. Uh, vision says, I have a dream. Culture says, this is how we march. And this is straight from Dr. Chan's book. Uh, vision says, it's about one day. Culture says, this happens every day. So while we go into that sweet by and by, this is what's happening in the nasty now now. <laughs> okay? Vision is what we're describing that we're trying to do. But we model vision with culture. We can't say we're going to be a place that, 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 that develops disciples, right? And, and our culture is that we nasty and mean. We can't, who, 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 we're going to run everybody away before we ever disciple them, right? So vision aligns values while culture demonstrates. So if we're going to say we are loving, then culture demonstrates loving. If we're going to say that one of our values is that we have free flow and worship, then our culture is if somebody lifts their hands around you, you ain't looking at them or they shouting, you ain't looking at them talking about how much longer you're going to do that when service is going to be over. Come on, I got brunch at 1230. That's culture, right? You fan them two times, talking about get up off the floor. We got to go, right? That's culture. <laughs> we got we to gotta, we gotta understand that, all right? Uh, so, so vision is, is how we have a dream. Let's keep going. Um, people in the organization must look both, to, both toward the future and in the present. And of course, vision is described, culture is modeled. Vision can't be demonstrated because it's not yet a reality. Now, vision also aligns with values and cultures demonstrates those values as well. All right. Now, I just put together this little list here of some things that will make an unhealthy, unhealthy culture. I'm not saying that these symptoms or these these characteristics are, are, are prevalent at, at, at Springfield. I'm just bringing up some things that would make an unhealthy culture. Stinginess, lack of communication, power struggles, fear, dishonesty, slow making, slow decision making. It take all day to get something done, right? That can be a cultural thing. Rigid and restricted in, in its thought, in its action, Right, unclear vision, strategy, goals, and values. Using people instead of valuing people. Clickish. That's a good one, isn't it? Yeah, clickish. Selfish. Unrealistic demands. Lack of authenticity. Dishonesty. Those are just a few. I could go on and on and on, but those are just a few. 
All right. So <clears throat> I just put this down. This is another little checklist for us. What is Springfield's culture? Is it toxic? Is it resistant to change? How are decisions made? How will people respond to leadership? How do we react to change? How do we respond to each other? What upsets us the most? All right. Uh, what is the mood or the atmosphere of church during the weekend on Sunday? What are the who are the non-positional power brokers? That means folk who ain't in position but always got an opinion about how they we ain't going there. All right. What what where are the control problems and power struggles and most where are they most evident? Who has the ear of some of the top leaders, right? Those are just things that 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 feed into the culture. All right. So that's that's where I want to stop with understanding vision and culture. And then I wanted to jump into this. Any questions about that? Uh, before I jump into the word fast real quick, let me see. Uh, uh, bless you, Sister Ingrid. Let me see real quick if we have any questions about vision before I jump into this uh, 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 fasting piece real fast. All I need is about five minutes on the fasting piece because the chapters are not very long at all. And I put the first chapter on the slide so we could go through it together. Uh, hey, Sister Joyce, God bless you. Uh, when we are in our set place, yes, 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 yes. If you have a question, go ahead and throw it in real quick so I can do my best to answer it. Uh, part of having a vision, not becoming satisfied with where you are. Absolutely. Eternal learners. Yes, 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 yes. We have to grow, Sister Judy. Absolutely. Absolutely. So learners and followers are synonymous in the context. Yes, 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 yes. That is right, Sister Stephanie. Being a learner and a follower, it should be synonymous. And, and what I mean, you're absolutely right. Because if you're going to follow, you got to learn from the one you're following. So absolutely. Um, follow both word and example. Yes. Uh, as a disciple, I should worship every day. Yep. Revelation role model. Pastor, I didn't know. <laughs> yep. There you go. Sister Judy said she was drugged to BTU. Except, absolutely. 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 And now look up. You look up now, and, and, and the thing that you were drugged to, you enjoy it. It, it is what God has used. Uh, for 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 where you are now, eat them peas. You don't have a choice but to eat them peas. You can sit at that table. Uh, thank you for yes. God bless you, Sister Maxine. Call to reach people, save people, save people. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Turn on the light, pass the salt. Yes. Now this is critical. Thank you, uh, Sister Obi. Use what God has given us. Whatever He's given you, use it. Use it. Don't don't covet what somebody else has. Use what God has given you. Making the plain obvious. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, Sister Stephanie. I agree. I agree. I wish I could. I do my best, but I don't quite, I don't quite, quite, quite tune the way I wanted to tune, but at least I get the information out, right? Uh, yes, I think we have an aha moment. You will shout because you finally understood something you may have been hitting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which goes back to, uh, to, to the eunuch that, uh, that um, uh, Minister Gary Nails played in the play, in, in, the, in the Black History Program. That eunuch once he came into light, it was like, wow. And he's the one that was charged of taking that, you know, across Africa. So that's like that aha moment, you know. I, I live for the light bulbs. I always say that. I live for the light bulb. I live to see them. I, number one, I live for the light bulb for myself. So I live for the light bulb of, see, of seeing light bulbs go off in other people's lives as well. Um, so uh, with culture, says Stephanie, uh, yep, that's it. So would culture have roots in tradition? That's a great question. Man, that's a great question. Great question. And the answer to that is yes. Um, but I think it's critical for us to know uh, what is, what, 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 it, how can I say it? It, it? It's understanding that yes, it may have its roots in tradition, but at the same time, it is understanding that, that when those cultures need to be adjusted or adapted, we not be so stuck in it as if it's law, okay? Uh, we really need to talk about culture. We do, we do, um, because because culture is so key to 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 what God is able to. For example, I, I'll use Springfield for example. This one thing about Springfield culture is that for the most part, Springfield it, not for the most part, but Springfield is a loving church. It's a friendly church. I ain't say everybody like everybody, but I say it's a friendly church, right? Right? It, it's it's a friendly church, you know. It is, it is, a, it's, it's that, 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 that welcoming spirit, right? That, that friendliness, that Springfield is the type of church where, where you can meet somebody today and you act like you've been knowing them all. You're like, hey, how you doing? So good to see you. That, that, that's Springfield, okay? And that's a cultural thing, yeah. Uh, 
How can you be a part of another? Yeah. Okay, that's a good, good, good question. All right. I, I, I can make that happen. Uh, I had somebody ask the question, how can you be a part of the 9 to Time Challenge if you don't use your cell phone and you want to get the encouragements? If that is you, send me an inbox and I'll make sure. I, if you have an email, I can I can get those emailed out to you uh, as well. So that's, that's another way you can get it. Sometimes the closer we get to growth, the devil sends obstacles. Yes, absolutely, sends angry. Listen, part, part of the devil's assignment is to stop you from growing. Do, do we understand that? The, the enemy does not want us to grow. That's part of his assignment to stop is to stop us from growing. All right. Oh, it, it's, it's so obvious. Go to Matthew. When you get a chance, look at Matthew chapter four. What, what's one of the things that, that fasting does for us? It helps us to grow closer to God. That's one of the things that this word fast, one of the desires is that we grow closer to God in our walk. So guess what will happen? That will be growth, right? So after Jesus has fasted 40 days and 40 nights in Matthew chapter four, guess who shows up? The devil. And what does he do? He offers three obstacles that tries to derail where Jesus just came from, right? Same thing with us. You got to understand, he's going to throw things at, at us, all right? Uh, can discernment can discernment help knowing the difference between can can discernment help knowing the difference between culture and tradition? Well, that's a good question, Sister Annette. Can discernment help with knowing the difference in tradition and culture? Well. Yes, yeah, yes, yes, it can. Um, you, you know, one, one of my favorite scriptures that, that would, that, uh, I believe if we're going to have a culture, it, it must be a flexible culture where we're able to adapt to what God is doing, not just what he's done, okay? And what I mean by that is it, it is about not putting that new wine in old wine skins. The purpose of a wine skin is that it expands, right? Uh, wine uh, was, was is something that expands. And if you put new wine into old wine skins, it'll cause the wine skins to burst. All right. And so so part of part of culture, uh, part of, of, of culture understanding is that that yes, this may be how things have been done, but the question becomes, does our culture line up with the vision that we're trying to produce? Yes. Yeah, look at that. Y'all see that? That is beautiful. Thank you, Sister Maxine. Sister Maxine put in the chat, Springfield has a great leadership team. Deacon Ron makes, makes you feel welcome and like you belong. That's awesome. That's awesome. That See, that's what it's all about. That I agree. Look at all the virtual members. They chiming in. Deacon Ron for president. Woohoo! 3G. Hip, hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. <laughs> I agree. Look, all of them. Sister F, Sister Kim. Look at that. That's but see, that's what it's all about. There you go. Look at them hand claps. See now, you see that? Now, now here's what's deep. Here's what's deep. What's deep is, yeah, there you go. Y'all keep them coming. This is encouraging. Y'all blessing my soul. Yeah. He sister Kim said he calls me and prays with me and checks in on me. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. And sister Kim is in New Jersey. Y'all don't want to talk. Listen, I'm telling you, once we begin to see this thing, how God is doing it. Amen. Amen. Listen, so true, Sister Buchanan. Listen, that's what it's all about. That's culture. So culture is not relegated to a space. Y'all hearing me? It, it is. There you go. Each one, reach one. Yep. Can't be described. Yep. Can't culture be described as tradition of a people? They do something on the regular. They are, they're not aware of it. It could be. That's a good way of putting it. It could be it could be something they do they're unaware of, but but what my assignment is to do is to help us identify those things because remember part of part of what we're trying to do is duplicate that in others. Okay, so 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 that so that is not just a brother Ron, but it's a brother Ron, it's a sister Sue, it's a sister Meg. It, 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 we we do because watch this. This is why Jesus says, "Greater work shall you do." which means then that I'm trying to multiply the efforts in you. Could you imagine if we had 10 Deacon Rons, how many folk God could send? Does that make sense? So now that Sister Kim a, a, has, been, has been impacted by Deacon Ron and, 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 and Sister, uh, Sister Doris and Sister Maxine, now they have been impacted. So imagine when those three begin to help and check in on our other virtual members. Y'all see how this thing could work? The culture has been established. Uh, and and that, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, somebody said, 
how do we change coach? Well, let's see, y'all, y'all, y'all not gonna let me, y'all not gonna let me get to uh my, my other part of my lesson tonight. Um, so one of the first, one of the first things about changing culture is to identify some some idiosyncrasies. Ooh, big word, right? The idiosyncrasies that may exist within the culture. All right. Let's say what's the idiosyncrasy? Let's say that uh, we have a. And I'm just making this up. Let's say we have a bottleneck when it comes to making decisions, and and when we make the decision, we always a day late and a dollar short, right? So 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 then. So then, so then that that then impacts our stewardship. Or by the time we make the decision, the decision is not us doing what we say we would do. It's something else. That that affects culture because guess what's going to happen if that happens often enough? Folks gonna say, "Well, it don't matter. They're gonna take forever to make a decision anyway. And when they make it, it's gonna be too late. Well, it don't matter because you, you see. So that that then affects the culture, right? So how do we how do we change that? Well. I think we change that by making sure that our culture properly aligns with the vision that we are seeking to go towards. You can't have a culture that won't allow the vision to manifest. Somebody ought to put that in. You, we can't have a culture that won't allow the vision to manifest, which is why I'm a, that we deal in the next 40 days with words, because what good is it? Okay, what good is it for us to have this vision if we gonna gossip? If we got a culture of gossip, it it don't matter our vision. Oh, what what if we got a culture of everybody got negative words? There you go, Mama Lucille from from uh, 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 right here in Jersey said I came to Pastor Hinton's installation and felt so welcome. There it is, right? So 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 we gotta understand that we play a part in the culture. OK, and that's why it's so critical that we look at the power. But that's why Sunday, you got it. Sunday, Sunday, when we look at when we look at for preaching, we gonna look at those those 12 spies that were sent out. And when they come back with the report they give. And they come back saying, uh, no, nah, I don't think we can do it. And, and, and hold on. But God already given a vision of the hours. So how you come back and say something that God ain't saying? And how many times that becomes culture, right? That becomes culture. And, 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 and oftentimes we, we become, we snare ourselves with our own words. <laughs> That's cultural. Yeah. Which, which is why, okay. Which is why, it, here, here's another way. We, we just coming out of Black History Month. Culture, cultural role. As, a, as, as African-Americans, there are things that 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 was embedded in us. If you haven't watched the sixteen, uh, was sixteen nineteen project on on uh, Hulu, please watch it. There are things that were embedded in us, right? From a cultural standpoint, right? Families ripped apart, the whole nine. And so now, what we put into us as a people, what 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 words of affirmation are we saying? Right, because they were they were critical in making sure they they put stuff in. Me being from Virginia, understanding where the banks of the jo of of James River is, understanding where where Willie Lynch, Lynch stood and read his letter on how to make a slave. Understand those nuances have been infused from a cultural standpoint. So how do we break that? How do we get us to see that we are bigger and better than that? How how do we get people to see that there was once a Hannibal? who was one of the best kings around in Africa. How, how do we get people to see that? How, how do we get people to see that our foreparents came from nothing? And, you know, how, how do we get that? So that, that could be seen as cultural. But every church has its own culture. For example, you, you can go to any church around the DMV and, and they may do stuff a little different than you, right? Somebody may have a parking lot attendant. They come out to you. They may have a shuttle to take you to the church. Somebody else may give you this. Somebody else may give you that. Somebody else, it's all culture. All right. I've felt nothing but truly blessed from being here. Amen. Amen. Come on, Springfield. Yeah. Sister Paul is amazing. Yes, she is. Look, we didn't go from 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 Deacon Ron to Sister Paul. That ain't on Sister Paul. Sister Paul is amazing. Look at here. Yes. Springfield is what's happening. Hello. Look at are y'all seeing us? Look at your chat. 
This is not me, this is culture. This is culture. And here's what's funny. You know what's funny? And this goes back to, I think, Sister Stephanie's question. Springfield does it, but hadn't identified it to be able to pass it along to other people. So that means if this is if this culture is passed online, it got to be in the South Campus. It got to be online. It got to be in the North Campus. It has to be a culture that exudes everywhere that we are. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Got it. And I have to give my shout out. Look, see, we didn't kept going. I got to give my shout out to Reverend Paul and Deacon Gavin. Look at that. It, it just goes on and on. Y'all seeing this? You can't have a culture that won't allow vision to manifest. Absolutely. 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 Yes, that's it. 1619 Project. Absolutely. It, and, and I pray that I am stretching us tonight because that, that's what it's all about. All right. So maybe we'll do another whole lesson on culture this year. Because there's some stuff. Y'all look, look, look at these questions. This, this is a question. This is this is this could be the start of the lesson right here. What what no, and look, don't say where well, Ram, you've been so good since you've been here. I've been done some stuff that's upset some folk. I know I have. I didn't upset some folk. You didn't got on that phone and say, that ain't how we do it. So I need to tell a little chubby preacher before he get back on the train. That ain't how we do it. I'm sure. Well, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Absolutely. Well, you know, I don't know about that. Uh, man, I don't know if we're going to be able to do it a different way. I get it. I get it. But that's why this year... It, see, it wasn't about me coming up with a cute thing. I prayed and asked God, what is it that he wants me to do? I'm, can I tell you what I want this year to be? This is what I want this year to be. I want this year to be for us to reimagine. To re God said, that ain't what I'm telling you to do. I want you to stretch the people. I want you to stretch them beyond their comfort zone so I could do something in their lives that I haven't done. Yep. Yep. And, and that's what it's all about. All right. So can y'all give me five minutes then, since we answered the questions, to, to break into our uh, piece for tonight, um, which, which deals with uh, our, our because tonight is the first night of it, and I want to deal with the 40-day word fast. All I did, uh, change can be frightening. Yes. So <laughs> see, Sister Judy, I was ready to move on, but you, you put in something else. That's true. Um, but but why, why, is it, why is it so frightening? And and uh, and. And the sermon that I didn't get to preach was Genesis chapter 15 uh, with Abraham. When, when he tells him to leave in 12, but by the time you get to 15, it's 25 years later and nothing has happened. And God tells Abraham to go outside and look up in the stars. He said, if you can count the stars, so shall be your offspring. And, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, the whole purpose was to get us to see that, that vision don't always happen on our time. But vision is always bigger when it happens in God's time. Okay, so so let's let's paint this picture then, because if we really gonna step forward and develop a culture, then then yes, thank Sister Paula Ray by faith we must remain optimistic individually and corporately. Yes, 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 yes. We could use it. Yes, you have to. But that's why we my one of my favorite books is the Book of Hebrews, by faith. By that's the Hall of Fame for faith. Okay, uh, I was just about to say something similar. See. There you go. Yep, we could use a lesson on culture because it, yep, it relates to tradition. Absolutely. 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 Change requires leaving your comfort zone and stepping out in faith. Absolutely, Sister Priscilla. Priscilla, you're absolutely right. It's, you, it's stepping out. So, so watch this. L look at how subtle the enemy can be. The, the point of, of, of the pointing of the finger and malicious talk, they want, yes, 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 yes. And, and watch this. So I'm going to read this because all too often, one of the key ways that, that the enemy comes after us is with our words, because we don't understand that we are spiritual spirit speaking beings. Somebody put that in. We are spiritual, spiritual, uh, spirit speaking beings. We are spiritual, spirit, spiritual, speaking, spiritual, spirit speech, speaking beings. What does that mean? That means if we are going back to Genesis chapter two, going to Genesis chapter three, if, if we are made in the image, in the likeness of God together, he made man and woman, right? If we are made in God's image, then that which God does, we are able to do. Stay with me. 
when you read Genesis chapter one, it says, the Lord said, God said, God said, God said. Now, here is my question for you. I really, I really want to entitle to title the series, Watch Your Mouth. But when I sent it, it was a little, that was a little curt. So when I, you know, I had to tone it down. Maybe that'll be my, maybe that'll be two or three years down the road when y'all can tolerate, you know, me being a little bit more of me. So I put the power of your words. You know, instead of watch your mouth, because I want to say, who do you think he talked to? I just did the power of your words, okay? Um, but we are spirit-speaking beings, and we must understand, somebody put this in, words are containers. Words are containers, yes. Pastor, can you teach a lesson on the demonic images? Oh, see? Oh, boy, y'all trying to get me going somewhere. Can I teach a lesson on the demonic Im 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 images of music industry, so forth and so on? Oh, you're trying to get me on something now. Okay, okay. Right. Wor so words are containers. <clears throat> words are meant to carry, okay? So if words are meant to carry, this is what the Bible said, life and death are in the power of the tongue, okay? Somebody put this in the chat. Words never stop moving. You just stop hearing them. So, so, so for example, if you had a, if we had a dog whistle, I could blow a dog whistle at a frequency that you couldn't hear, but it's just because you can't hear it don't mean it's not a sound. That's why we have to be careful what we put into the atmosphere. Psalm 103 says angels are willing and abetting and waiting to hear the word to make that manifest. Okay. So because words are containers, one of the tricks that the enemy uses on us is to allow us to haphazardly use words that sabotage our own destiny. <laughs> Y'all hear me? Come on, we got to roll. It's 852. We use words that sabotage our own destiny. So, so, so we, 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 we then say things that go against the vision that God has given you for your life. Which is where, if you ever learn how to talk right, then your life will turn around. Come here, woman with the issue of blood. She, she, the Bible says she said to herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. And, and, and research, so she said it over and over and over and over again. If I could just touch the hem of his garment, if I could just touch the hem of his garment. And guess what happened? She touched the hem of his garment. I would be made whole. So much so when she touched it, Jesus said, hold on, who touched me? <laughs> Virtue left his body. You know, you know, you know, you got some power in your word when you convince yourself to touch him and he not touch you and you get healed from you touching him. Oh my gosh. And you think that it doesn't matter what you say? Come here to help. You is kind. You, you remember all that from the help? That those positive affirmations. Yeah. 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 See. That's right, Dr. Tucker. She says, well, you, you, when that was powerful. Now talk right and your life will turn around. Yes. Somebody put this in. Your life follows your words. Your life follows your words. Now, and I wish I had time. If I ever could get you to the point of understanding the power of your words, then you would replace your words with his word. And when you do that, that becomes the word homologio, the Greek word, homo meaning same, logio meaning word, when you start saying the same word that God says. <laughs> That's when you begin to pray his word back to him. Because he ain't obligated to your word, he's only obligated by his. All right, all right, all right, all right. So let me, let me read this real quick. Yes, 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 yes. See, now this is the type of stuff I love, okay? Um, all right, so, so, so let's read this real fast. For those who don't have it, I'll make sure, uh, Sister Paul, I'll try to send this out to you. And for the next 40 days, if we could just make sure uh, people are able to email it, and I e we email it out to them uh, through, through MailChimp. If we don't have your email, please call the church office. Somebody put the number in there so that we can get you on the list and make sure you have that uh, as well. Um, let, let me read this to you real quick, and then we can move forward. Um, and this is straight. All I did was copy and paste from my book. Um, it says, uh, and this is Isaiah 58, 6. Is it is not this kind of fasting I've chosen to loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke 
to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. If you, excuse me, do away with the yoke of oppression, the pointing of finger and malicious talk. And that was Isaiah 56. So the key for today, well, it's already tonight, but the key was pointing finger and malicious, malicious talk. Uh, what an exciting, oh, what an exciting challenge. It says, uh, <clears throat> it may be heard, it may be hard for you today to envision changing your habitual judgments of others or the way you size people up when you meet them. I know it was for me when I began working on this area of my life. So let's start with a preliminary inventory. During the day, do you find yourself being critical of your boss or using sar sar sarcastic humor? Uh, what is your first response when someone suggests something new to think about what can go wrong? Or do you find yourself complaining about the items of little consequence that come along with it uh, or come along? When, when was the last time you sat and listened as someone passed on a juicy piece of gossip? When was the last time you were the one passing on a little piece of news about another person? For some, eliminating the pointing of fingers and malicious talk will prove to be a lifestyle change in an area that has developed over many years. Or perhaps it may be something that you already that already tugs at your heart every time you remember the awful words you can't believe that came out of your mouth. Some things only happen by prayer and fasting. In this case, we're referring to fasting from our in our words. But such a change is possible. And of course, we have an intercessor, a great high priest, Christ, standing in the gap uh, for us when we fall short. The truth is we can't change our pattern with our words by the arm of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. That's Galatians 5.17. And the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you do not do whatever you want. Our flesh does not have what it takes to make this kind of change with our words. When the last time you said, listen to a piece of juice, when the last time you don't want to it on, listen to this, listen to this. It says, uh, here it is. Our flesh doesn't have what it takes to make this kind of change. Bridling the unruly member of the tongue and bringing it under control of the spirit is the greatest of all challenges. However, the Lord has given us his Holy Spirit for such a purpose. So we need the Holy Spirit then to help us to guard our tongue. This fast that Isaiah chose, a fast to break the bonds of wickedness and the bands of the yoke and to set the oppressed free. By the grace of God is the fast that we will undertake now, a 40-day fast of words. Here's the daily journal moments. See, these are questions that you ask yourself. What is the Lord speaking to me through the verse of Isaiah? Uh, what are the particular words that came out of my mouth today that I need to repent from? I ask the Holy Spirit to touch my heart and keep these words out of my mouth tomorrow. Where do I need the most corrective correction in my words? Is it with judgment, criticism, sarcasm, negativity, complaining, gossip, with family, friends, church members, co-workers, acquaintances, authorities, or any others? So that that is uh, uh, in excuse me in a nutshell what uh, today's lesson was about. It is making sure that we do two things. That is one we not point fingers and two we don't have malicious talk against one another so what i will do is i'll make sure that we push this information uh to sister paul so that she's able uh to disseminate it on tomorrow and uh, on the upcoming days uh for those who do not have the book as of yet now i won't uh and see, y'all ain't gonna get me in trouble with plagiarism where I just send the whole chapters to y'all and y'all be printing it out. So I, I'm gonna have to watch this. I gotta figure out a way that I can, that I can do it uh, where it can keep me out of trouble as well. Uh, yes, uh, any other questions real quick and then I'm, uh, then I'm gonna uh, close out. I'm a, I'm a true believer that words have power. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, starting with oneself. Please share because I don't have the book. Okay, all right, I'll make sure. I'll make sure um, that we do just that. Also, uh, uh, what is this saying that when you, oh, there you go. When you point a finger, three are pointing back at you. Absolutely. That is true. That's absolutely true. So let me stop sharing. Uh, and I'll do my best to make sure that the information is available so that you can uh, be blessed. Uh, but for the next 40 days, y'all, we're going to watch our words uh, because we want God to do some amazing. I know some people saying, why well, we ain't fast? Enough. We will. We will. But this is what the Lord put on my heart uh, for us to fast from, um, to understand the power. So, so, so for the month of, 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 of March, 
and the first two weeks of April, all the way up to Easter, with fasting, with our words, and each day will be something different, okay? All right. Um, uh, I pray tonight that, that that closure, at least we try to, to develop a little bit with the vision and culture tonight as it related to that, and then to push into the power of our words. I'm looking forward to Sunday, but in, in the weeks to come, as we, as we grow and understand the power of our words, uh, to know exactly just that. Uh, thank you, Sister Stephanie, for putting up the number. If you have not emailed the church or call the church so that you can email, so I can put you on the email list, I'll have her send it out to uh, Sister Paul to add you onto the list so that you can I receive that information. All right. All right. Don't forget to call. Yes, please don't forget to call the church so you can receive this information. All right. Tonight, listen, I pray tonight that you were blessed. And here it is. Here's the language. I'm giving you the opportunity to make a spiritual decision for you to take a step in your spiritual growth okay uh yep or if you want to thank you sister brenda sister brenda said you can send an email if you want to to sbc uh indc at gmail.com sbc ndc indc at gmail.com that's a quicker way for her to have your email address as well all right uh but i want to give you the opportunity to be able to make a spiritual decision tonight for you to say lord I, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that you're the Christ and I confess in my mouth that you're Lord and I want to be saved. That's the first invitation for your spiritual decision to be made. Second uh, invitation for a spiritual decision is for you to say, Lord, I've tried you before, um, but I fell off. I messed up and I want to rededicate myself. Wow, we got 80 some people, almost 80 people on. God be praised. Um, I want to rededicate my life to try this again, to say I messed up, but I want to get back in fellowship with you. All right. And third invitation. Amen, Sister Tucker. Third invitation is for you to connect with us. Y'all, if, if you haven't picked up on it yet, God is doing something special here at Springfield. God is doing something amazing here at Springfield. And I believe that in this season, we don't want to be left out from what God is doing. I believe wholeheartedly that God has great things in store for us. Uh, 81. Awesome. Thank you, Sister Stephanie. Uh, I, 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 I believe that you don't want to miss out on what God is doing. So if you in the DMZ or abroad and you want to connect with us, you, you believe that, that, that God has tapped me to be your pastor. And this is the set place that God will have for you to be where you can grow, where you can develop, where you can become. That's you. Do me a favor on tonight. Email us at join at springfielddc.org. Join at springfielddc.org. We gather all your information or you can inbox right now to Springfield Baptist Church and we'll be able to welcome you and, and, and minister to your needs. I'm gonna pray for you and then we're gonna move forward. God, I thank you for this time of study on tonight. I thank you for even healing in my body. I thank you now that you do all things well and God, you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. Thank you for this time of last month on vision. And even now, as we move forward to understanding the power of our words, now, God, I ask now that, that we understand the power of our words is so important, even when it is coming to salvation, because we're able to confess with our mouths and believe in our heart that you are the Christ and that you were raised for the dead for our sins. So, God, I pray for now those who are making a spiritual decision for salvation, for rededication, and for membership to become a part of Springfield Baptist Church at the North Campus, the South Campus, or either a part of our global campus. God, we thank you in advance. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray, thank God, and amen, and amen. All right, so go ahead, email us at join at Springfield, D.C., and I promise you, you've already heard about the culture. We will welcome you to the fold, all right? Uh, before I turn it back over to Reverend Penix, listen, each and every week I say this, y'all know we in the middle of our 90-day tithe challenge, which is a spiritual decision. So if you are a part of our tithe challenge, if not, you can become a part of our tithe challenge on tonight. Uh, somebody put that number in for me if you know it. Uh, you can become a part of our tithe challenge tonight. Uh, but we, we believe in giving, uh, especially on our Wednesday nights. We believe that God has been so good to us uh, that we ought to give as we receive the word, uh, on, even on Wednesday nights. And so if you want to give, you can see the link right there in the chat. Uh, where you can click that link and you're able to give through Givelify. Or if you want to give through uh, Cash App, simply dollar sign SBC downtown, and you're able to give that way. If you want to join in on our, our on our 90-day uh, child challenge, it's not too late. Uh, just